I will sing, it will be a song with glorious harmony when the courts of heaven ring. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody with heaven's harmony. In my heart there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. Amen. Go ahead, take a seat. Sing with me that passage from Isaiah. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their string. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord, to wait. Amen. Good singing.
Mm. All right. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. God is good. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Amen. All right. So where was I? Um, and so uh, ministers' lives that do obey the Word of God and try to live by it and, and preach and proclaim His Word, uh, the counsel of God, without uh, shame or, or any of those kind of things, often convicts those who are ungodly and live ungodly lives. As a result, the wicked often react by persecuting them. Sadly, it is often the same reaction when they proclaim the Word of God as well. They don't want to hear their sin. They don't want to hear about what's wrong with them. And they certainly don't want to hear about God's coming judgment. They don't want to hear those things. And that's the society in which we live in today. We live in a very anti-God, anti-God's word society. That's where we're at today. People don't want to hear it. People don't want to be corrected. If they do believe in God, they want a God that's all lovey-dovey and kind, and there's no negative whatsoever. They want the power of positive thinking, and that's the idea of God that they have in their lives. And so, therefore, really, the idea that they have of God is not the real God at all. Because the truth of the matter is, yes, there is much love, there is much truth, there is much hope. But boy, there's a lot of correction in the Word of God, amen? All through the Old Testament, we see God correcting His people. All through the New Testament, we see the commands of God towards the New Testament believers. We see so much there. And most people just don't want to hear it, hence the size of the crowd that we have tonight, amen? Instead of having packed out church houses like we should have in our day and age as we see the day approaching, we see a lot less people than ought to be here. And sadly, there's a lot of people that do know the truth and aren't here tonight and ought to be here tonight. And so as we look at this, simply put, few people have, uh, want to have their sin pointed out and even few want to hear the judgment of God. The simple point is, is it's difficult to be a true minister because we live in a corrupt and depraved world, amen? And it's not getting any better, it's getting worse. And all you have to do is just turn on the news and you'll see all the depravity. You'll see all the wickedness and all the, the bad things that are happening. And you'll see everything that's taking place around the world right now. We're nigh the door of the rapture, amen? I'm excited about that. The truth is the world is full of selfishness, covetous, immoral, lawless, uh, uh, violent people who prefer to continue in their wicked lifestyles rather than accept Christ and embrace a new way of life. Amen? And so, you know, it's kind of like this, you know, a lot of people want to say they're a Christian, but saying it don't make it so. Amen? A changed life is what truly shows whether somebody's been born again or not. And so, as we look at this, if there was ever a preacher who had a tough calling, Ezekiel was one of them. Ezekiel was one of those men that had a tough calling on their life. God called Ezekiel to be a very special prophet. His ministry would be special in that he would focus primarily upon the deeply discouraged Jewish exiles in Babylon. And in, in this exile, this group of people, there was a spirit of hopelessness amongst them. They felt hopeless. And here's the reason why. They were in exile. They had been taken captive. They were children of the captivity. And so the group that, that Ezekiel was with was a part of the second deportation. So this group that was a part of the second deportation experienced the first deportation. And so they saw it. They seen all those things happen. They saw the bloodshed. They saw all of the different things that took place to their, their homes, to their community, to their country, to their government, to their places of worship. They saw their friends and many of their family die and slain by the hand of the Babylonians. They seen these things and they were taken captive. And now as we look at this, we get into this, they, it was a rough situation for them to be in. And as we look at the doom and gloom of what's happening in our day and age, I'm glad I'm a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. I'm glad that there's hope in Jesus and that I'm going to heaven someday. But boy, I'm telling you, we're looking at some dark days. 
We're going to experience some persecution in our life. I truly believe that to be the case. And boy, I'll tell you, I think that we're really close to seeing some things happen. And so as we look at this, we see this. We see in chapter 1, God begins to prepare this man of God by giving him the vision of God's glory. And boy, what a blessing that is. Amen. It's a wonderful thing to have the call of God on your life, but it's a wonderful thing when God confirms that call with something special. And I'm thankful for that. I can remember the day when I was over in Germany, and I remember the missionary preaching, a uh, missionary to Moldova. He was there. His name was Dewey Fisher, and he was preaching away. And, and God began to smoke my heart and convict and deal with me. And, and that verse in the Bible that God gave me was 1 Thessalonians 5, 24. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. And God cemented that calling in my life. And I went forward during that Thursday night church service and, and got on my face, and, and I surrendered to the Lord God of heaven that I would do what he wanted me to do. I would go where he wanted me to go. And I'm very thankful that I have. I'm thankful that God called me to Bell Fountain, Ohio. Amen. So I could get to know some Bell Tuckians. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It's good to be saved. And so, even in the worst of circumstances, God still reveals himself and God still calls. I'm thankful for that, amen. I'm glad that God still hears and God still speaks. Let me ask you, do you have a vision? Let's look at some opening thoughts of the book of Ezekiel. The first thing I want you to notice, number one, the age of Ezekiel. The age of Ezekiel, verse number one. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Chabar, that the heavens were open and I saw visions of God. The first thing we can see here is it gives in the 30th year. Now, a lot of times when it says in the such and such year, it's in relation to a historical moment or something along those lines. But in this passage, we don't really have any connector to make that statement. And so as, as I dug around, I read a whole bunch of different uh, theologians, uh, so-called, so and uh, uh, read all these different guys. There was all kinds of different ideas about this. One was an idea of Nebuchadnezzar's dad and something to do with him, and I looked into that a little bit, and I didn't agree with them on that. And, uh, and I looked at some other different things that maybe possibly it was when Josiah, because the time frame seems to be right, when the, the book of the law was found in the house of the Lord there with Josiah, and it would be about the right time frame, and supposedly that was possibility. I don't think that was it either. What I think it is, is Ezekiel here in this passage, he's called a priest. He's called a priest. And so as we look at this, we see this, Ezekiel the priest. He was a part of the Levitical family. And he was supposed to be uh, serving in the temple of the Most High God. Amen. He was supposed to have his course just like uh, uh, John the Baptist's father did. And he was about his course when he had the vision from God. And the angel came to him and told him about John the Baptist. Are you with me? And so, and when that course started... When they were at the age of when they would be, it was 30 years old. Go ahead and take your Bibles, if you would, please, and go back to Numbers chapter number 4. I want you to see this. Numbers chapter number 4. Amen. Numbers chapter number 4. 30 years old. Numbers chapter number 4. <coughs> the age of Ezekiel. Numbers chapter number four. Look at verse number one when you get there. Say amen. Verse number one, the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Take the sum of the sons of Kohath uh, from among the sons of Levi after the families by the house of their fathers from thirty what? years old and upward, even until 50 years old, 
all that enter into the host to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. And so from 30 years to 50 years, that was the age, the time frame when a man under the, the family of Levi could serve in the temple. They could do their courses and their administration and, and, and all of the different things that they would do at the house of the Lord when it came to the sacrifices and all of these different things. It was their time to minister. And so as we look at this, he was most likely referencing his age, okay? And so 30 years old. Look at verse number 23. It reiterates it's in verse number 23. And it says, from 30 years old and upward until 50 years old, shalt thou number them all that enter in to perform the service to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. Now in Numbers, they had the tabernacle, the tent that they traveled around with. Over later in the, under uh, uh, King Solomon, they built the actual temple, amen? And so it was the same service that would take place there. And so we see in Ezekiel chapter number one, now it came to pass in the 30th year. I believe Ezekiel is referencing his age. He's 30 years old. And I'll explain that a little bit here in just a moment. I also want to note something else. Over in Luke chapter number three, verse number 23, and Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. Amen. Amen being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Eli. And so Jesus, when he started his public ministry, he was 30 years of age. And I believe that we can see some pictures of Ezekiel in reference to Jesus Christ. And we'll see that throughout the scriptures in the book of Ezekiel. Okay, and so as we look at this, the age of Ezekiel is 30 years old. Secondly, I want you to notice the place of Ezekiel. In verse number one, he's by the river Chebar. Amen. He's up in uh, Babylon. Now, the river Chebar is roughly two miles north of Babylon. It flows into the great river Euphrates there in that place. It's about two miles north. And so that second deportation of the Jews was dropped off north of Babylon, and that's where they uh, settled in and built and did all those things. And, and they really did have quite a bit of freedom there in the land of their captivity. They really did. And uh, we'll see a little bit more about that. Ezekiel had a house. He, had, he was married and uh, different things like those. Uh, but we see this. The place was by this river. Now I want you to go over to a passage that I believe to be a parallel passage of this. Go to the book of Psalms with me, if you would, please. Psalm chapter number 37. Psalm chapter number 37. To give you a little bit more of the setting of the way these people are feeling. Psalm chapter number 37 in your Bibles. And this is a Psalm of the Captivity. Psalm chapter number 37. It's right after Psalm chapter number 30, 136, amen? 137, I meant 137. And so in Psalm 136 is about what? The mercy of the Lord endureth forever, amen? And then it gets into Psalm 137. When you get there, say amen. amen. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we what? When we remembered what? Jerusalem. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. They didn't want to play instruments. They didn't want to sing. Look at what it says. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Are you with me? Now these folks have been in this place, this river, and as you can see from the scene, they're sad. They're weeping. They're heartbroken. They've seen their country destroyed. They've seen, they they've themselves have been taken captive. It's a difficult setting, and Ezekiel is being called to minister to these people. It's probably not a real easy thing, and I'll explain a little bit more of that here in just a moment. 
And so we see the place of Ezekiel. Hey, it's by this river. And from what we can tell and everything that we can read about this and study about this, these people were downhearted. These people have felt hopeless. They've been taken captive and taken to a foreign land. They're living north of the main city. Uh, there's all kinds of things going on, and, and they're in captivity. They're slaves. They've seen their loved ones killed. Many, I guarantee you, every one of them have seen some of their family, some of their friends, some of these things taken, and they've saw them die. They saw them battle. No doubt, uh, amongst uh, Jerusalem at this point in time, there's been battles. Uh, many of the young men, if not most of the young men, are dead. Because those are the warriors. Are you with me? And so this is a very difficult place. It's a place of defeat and despair for the children of the captivity. So we see the place of Ezekiel. We see the age of Ezekiel. Thirdly, I want you to notice the time of Ezekiel. Look at verse number two with me. In the fifth day of the month, which is probably around July, just for your information, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity. King Jehoiachin's captivity. Now go over to 2 Chronicles with me. 2 Chronicles chapter number 36, if you would please. 2 Chronicles chapter number 36. I want you to see this. 2 Chronicles chapter number 36. It's the last chapter of the book of 2 Chronicles. The Chronicles of the Kings. And then from there we jump into Ezra, which is many, many years later, because the captivity that they were told would happen would be 70 years. Yeah. Chapter number 36, if you would look with me at verse number 8. If you're there, say amen. Now the rest of the acts of Ejoia Kim and his abominations which he did, and that which was found in him, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah, and Jehoiachin, his son, reigned in his stead. Jehoiachin, which is mentioned in Ezekiel, this is the king, was eight years old when he began to reign. Man, can you imagine having to become king of that mess? <laughs> Amen. And he reigned how many months? Three months and ten days in Jerusalem. So he had a very short reign. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And when the year was expired, King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon with the goodly vessels of the house of the Lord and made Zedekiah his brother king over Judah and Jerusalem. Now, I don't know if you have this kind of Bible, but my Bible has dates in it. And the date next to when he became king was 599 B.C. And so, and that was the year that King Nebuchadnezzar took him to Babylon. And that was also the same time that Ezekiel was taken to Babylon. Are you with me? And so it's the fifth year. So we know that the, the time of Ezekiel in this writing, when he is writing, when he's getting this vision, it is roughly 594 B.C., five years later. It was 599 when they were taken captive, roughly. I, I'm guessing 599. We we're hoping those dates are right. And it's now five years later, 594 B.C. And you know, before Christ, the years count down, and then they begin to count up at Christ. Are you with me? A.D., uh, after death, B.C., before Christ. And uh, that's probably not the actual term, but that's what I call it. Amen. And so, hallelujah, in the year of our Lord. Amen. And so, as we look at this, we see this. Uh, so, the present year was most likely 594 B.C. And so, it's five years later into the captivity. Five years later, they haven't heard a word from the Lord. For five years, they've been in captivity, not a word from God, not a sign of hope from the Lord, not a sign of deliverance, any of these different things. Ezekiel, he turns 30 this year. Most likely, he's by the river complaining with the rest of them, moaning and groaning, because this was the year he was supposed to be able to have the privilege of serving in the temple when it was all supposed to start, that just that first time that he was going to get to minister and do whatever it was that was going to be his course to do. Can you imagine what it must have been like? He's 30 years old and he knows everything that he's lost. 
and all of these things. And he's probably talking to the Lord. And I think he probably had a good relationship with God. I mean, he'd been taught. He was being prepared to serve in the, in the temple. He had known the laws and the commandments of God. He had been taught the Pentateuch, no doubt. He had had to memorize the Pentateuch from a child and had to learn those five first books of the Bible. He knew what he was supposed to do. He knew how to minister to the people of God. And so, but at this time, he'd been there for five years and not heard a word. And while he's by the river, most likely praying, all of a sudden, God answers. And we see the call of Ezekiel. Look at it with me. Ezekiel, in the beginning of the 70-year captivity, having heard nothing from the Lord by the river, most likely complaining, and really, the, the trouble that was there, because there was a lot of false prophets giving false hope, saying that, that they're going to get delivered, saying that they're going to, that, that, listen, we're going to be delivered, and we're going to be victorious, and Jerusalem's going to rise back up, and Judah's going to There was all these false prophets doing these things. And if you remember, over with Jeremiah... Now, Zedekiah has been king now for uh, five years. They haven't been pulled into captivity yet. Are you with me? Zedekiah is there. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is, is threatening him to cause him to bow. They won't do it. And Jeremiah is there. Just submit. You'll get to stay in the land. You'll get to stay here, and, and everything will be fine, and you'll just serve them for, for a time and all of these things, and they won't listen to the man of God. And all of these other false prophets are saying, no, we're going to be victorious. We're going to defeat their armies. We're going to get to stay in the land. We're going to get prosper and all of these kind of things. They were just telling the people what they wanted to hear, false prophets. But that's not the case. And we see here in Ezekiel, he is facing some pretty heavy things to have to face. But praise be to God, he's a man of God. Amen. Amen? The call of Ezekiel. And so... He's, he's lost out on serving in the temple, and then all of a sudden, God calls him from priest to prophet. Amen? And what a wonderful thing. And notice with me what he got to see, verse number 1. Verse number 1, look at that last sentence. That the heavens were what? Opened. And I saw what? Visions of God. Can you imagine what it must have been like? We're talking about the heavens were opened. Now, listen, I'm not talking about some clouds parted in the sky <laughs> and the sun came out. I'm talking about, listen, this realm was parted, and he could see into that realm. He could see into heaven itself. The heavens were opened. And you know what? I've never seen heaven. I've only daydreamed about it. Amen? Man, I'd like to see what heaven's... I can't wait to see what heaven's looking like. But Ezekiel got to see it. What a tremendous thing. Amen? This man got to see things we look forward to seeing. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Ezekiel got to see into heaven. And he didn't just get to see into heaven, but he got to see visions of God. He got to see visions of God. Now, that does not mean he saw God, because no man hath seen God. If Moses wanted to see God, he says, you can't handle it. You'll die immediately. I'll just let you see the kind of the, 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 the hind side of me. You know, this the tail end of the, uh, basically like the comet has that tail on it, and you see that. That's kind of what he saw of God, just kind of like the glimmer shining off of him. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The Shekinah glory. That's right, brother. And so, and that's what, you know, as he's looking, he saw visions of God, visions of God, God's visions. Are you with me? And so as we look at this, we see this, he, what he got to see. He got to see some amazing things. Isaiah 64, 4, for since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Isn't that awesome? Isaiah 64, 6 is a parallel passage to 1 Corinthians 2, 9. And so as we look at this, we see this, the things he got to see. He got to see some amazing things. Must have been incredible. 
And after he saw those things, no doubt he had no problem speaking what he needed to say and sharing what God wanted him to share because he had an experience with God. Not only what, what he got to see, but listen, look at verse number three. Not only what he got to see, but what also what he got to hear. Look at verse number three. The word of the Lord, what? Came ex what? Expressly. Amen. I like the express lane. Amen. It gets a lot faster in that lane. <laughs> Are you with me? Expressly unto Ezekiel the what? Priest. Amen. The word of the Lord came to him. Not only did he get to see into heaven and he got to see visions of God, but he also got to hear from God. He got to hear the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord came unto him. He got to hear it. He saw it and he heard it. Amen. And I'm here to tell you something right now. I am so thankful that I may never physically see God, but I can still see him face to face. Amen. 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 Man, I'm telling you something right now because when I can look in the Bible, I can see my Jesus. Well, I can see what he has for me. And you know what? The word of the Lord came to Jim Frost, and I'm glad it did because I got born again that day, man. I got to see Jesus, and I got to understand about salvation, and God moved, and Jim Frost got born again. Man, I'm thankful for the call of Ezekiel. He got to see some things, and he got to hear some things. He heard the word of the Lord. What a blessing that is. Man. We're talking about something that's never going to fade away, something that's never going to perish. Amen. Listen, you think about the vision he saw, it's never going to rust. Hey, listen, we're going to talk about the things that he saw later next week. But, man, I'm telling you something, that's an amazing thing. And we'll explain what those things meant. And you know what? Those visions that he saw in chapter number one weren't for everybody else. They were for him because it was a part of his calling. It was to give him the confidence he needed to do some things that he's going to have to do that are very difficult. What he got to not only see and what he got to hear, but also what he got to feel. Look at verse number three again. And the hand of the Lord was there upon him. Not only did he get to see, and not only did he get to hear, but praise God he got to feel. He felt the hand Amen. of the Lord upon him. Man, I'm telling you something right now. Doesn't that get you excited? Because I'm here to tell you something. I'm glad that God doesn't consider himself so great that he would never, ever touch one of us. And you say, how do you know that? I don't know. Jesus, God on earth, he touched the leper. He touched the blind eyes. Hey, listen, are you with me? He wasn't afraid to touch those sinners and those publicans. Hey, listen, God wants to put his hand upon you just like he did Ezekiel, amen. He wants you to be able to feel his presence. Man, it's exciting to know that God wants to put his hands on you, amen. I just, I'm, I'm telling you something right now. I just know from the bottom of my feet, top of my head, someday I'm going to get to hug Jesus. Amen. You say, you really think so? Absolutely, amen. I'm telling you something right now. Can you imagine what it's going to be like getting to hug the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and that, hey, listen, I don't know about you, but the church is his bride. I don't, I don't ever hug my bride. Are you kidding me? <laughs> oh, man. Can you imagine what it's going to be like? The Lord loves us. And these, these people that had been disobedient and ungodly, they were there because of their rebellion against God as a nation. They were in a bad place. And you know what? God raised up a prophet who was a priest so that he could send a message to him to let him know some things. And boy, that was the message of Ezekiel. Get right with God. When all these other people, these false prophets, were saying, oh, God is good. He's going to deliver us, and we're going to get out of here. No, we've already read. The, the Bible's very clear. They were going to be in captivity for 70 years. They weren't getting out until those 70 years were over. Are you with me? And so these people are lying about it, and Ezekiel's saying, no, you're sinners. 
You need to repent and get right with God. You broke his law. You didn't keep those seven years of letting the land rest like it said in the law. That was one of the sins that they had done. They just planted every year over and over and over again, and they never had the Sabbath of the land. Why? That's exactly right, because they wanted the bucks, amen. They didn't let the land rest. They didn't do all kinds of things. They were worshiping false gods. The, what, was, what was Jeremiah trying to tell them? Don't believe in the queen of heaven. And that's what they were worshiping in Jerusalem. And boy, I'll tell you, the Lord God in heaven, he doesn't share his glory with anybody. And what he got to feel, the hand of the Lord was upon him. Isaiah 50, verse number 2, Wherefore, when I came, was there no man. When I called, there was none that to answer. Is my hand shortened at all? that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Behold, at my rebuke I dry up the sea. I make the rivers a wilderness. Their fish stinketh, because there is no water, and dryeth for thirst. Listen, is the hand, Lord's hand shortened? Isaiah 59, 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. Neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. Right. Amen. Amen. Numbers eleven twenty three and the Lord said unto Moses, Is the Lord hand waxed short? Thou shalt see now whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. Amen. God's word always comes to pass. Amen. Jeremiah thirty two seventeen. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Amen. There's nothing too hard for our God. You say, I just don't know. I just don't know if God can get us out of this. or I don't know if God can work in my family. I don't know if God can get a hold of that individual. Well, I'll tell you what, all you've got to do is ask. Yeah. The Bible's clear. His hand is not shortened. Listen. God can slap around that filthy sinner until they're willing to wake up. Amen. I'm telling you right now, God can. You just got to be willing to. That's right, brother. You sure are. Amen. And so, hey, listen, I'm telling you right now, God's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. He is still in the saving business. He's still in the working business. He's still getting a hold of people and calling people and saving people. Listen, the bottom line is, is God's not dead and he's not done. If he was done, we wouldn't be here. Amen. He's still at work. Don't give up. Don't give in. Keep on fighting because some things are worth fighting for. Amen. Everyone standing, every head bowed, every eye closed.